Hey, welcome to the Making of an Exception podcast. My name is Kirk Graham, and today uh, we've got somebody that I look up to so much and has been a mentor voice in my life, Uh, really a spiritual father. No, I'm just kidding, but uh, he's amazing. His name is Paul Herkman. Thanks for being here, Paul. I'm excited to be here. I'm a little bit uh, nervous because I don't sound nearly as good as you. You even Stop like it. we're just hanging out talking, and yeah. you slap your hands, and all of a sudden you're like in full on podcast radio. Well, that voice. was it. That was the intro. I know, so but it's now good. that the intro's over, we're just going to talk. Okay. And your voice is actually one of the most soothing voices of all time. So this is for people listening. They're going to really appreciate you. I'll send you some recordings for when you go to bed at night. I'll just Great. talk to you. Put you to sleep. That's right. We'll have good dreams. Uh, Paul is the executive director of Venture, um, which is an amazing organization that does things all around the world, uh, helping people. And uh, it it would be wrong of me to try to explain all of it. But um, kind of jumping in, tell us what Venture is um, and what you guys are doing today all in really around the world. Yeah, it's so... Venture, you can come at it from two different ways, but really yep. what, what most people understand is we do biking, hiking, and running, yep. and then we raise money for justice projects and missions projects around the world. And so we say we do tough things for people in tough places. The tough yep. things are anything from running a 5K to running a 100-mile race in one day. Somebody's done that? Yes, we've wow. had. So we we have like thousands that do what we call the on ramp or the entry, and that's five Ks or logging a mile a day for thirty days. Uh, those are things that almost anybody can do, and it's a way for them to get off the couch and move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of other people. This wow. is um, a, a model that we use. But then we have the extreme or the epic, and that's like we have a group of runners that um, run a hundred miles in one day, an ultra marathon, or a group of cyclists that cycle 200 miles in one day. And with all of these things, they're raising money for something like refugee care or human trafficking, extreme poverty, uh, different microfinance solutions for justice work around the world. Wow. What, what are what are a couple projects? Um, so and we'll talk about like on this side uh, of what people are doing uh, other. Yeah. You said paddling. You said some other things, but uh, projects around the world. I know you're in Nepal, um, but if there's a couple uh, places where it's like this is kind of the impact we're making, uh, the tough places part. Yeah. So on a, on a macro level, most of our foundational work is in Southeast Asia. Yeah. We talk about there are some organizations that are what organizations organizations. They do clean water or they do trafficking. We talk about ourselves as a where organization yeah. and it's a it's an intersection. So if you can picture a Venn diagram, if you want to go deep into your math roots, those Amazing. are those two circles that overlap. Um, they can be many circles, but we have two circles that overlap. One circle is least reached. And yeah. as a faith-based organization, yeah, we yeah. are interested in the places where there is less than 2% gospel witness. Yeah, yeah. That then overlaps with the least resourced, and that's justice issues. Yeah. And so those justice issues, depending on where we're at, we identify. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, some of the big ones are human trafficking, yep. uh, child soldiering, yep. uh, refugee crisis, and then extreme poverty. And so we address, depending on where we're at, through the local church, we address those things through things like feeding programs, safe houses, education, microfinance, church planting, discipleship programs. Um, and so that's why we say we're a WARE organization, because yep. we we do a lot of things based on what is already happening through the local church in those areas and how we can respond with both relief, but then also community sustainable development so that those communities flourish in the way that we believe the gospel invites all people in all communities to flourish. Wow. Yeah. You, you being the executive director, you just explain what you do so well. And I, I've never, uh, I've never heard, I've known venture for a while. Um, and I've known you for a while. Uh, and we'll get into that, but the, the Venn diagram thing, Kaylee and I, my wife, we, uh, started the process of adoption. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was before our second daughter. And we put it on pause because all of a sudden she got pregnant. It was awesome. Uh, but eventually we will. And our filter for adoption uh, was that same type of thought, which is awesome to see that you built an entire organization with that, that where in the world is the most unreached people uh, with, yeah, uh, under-resourced is kind of mm-hmm. how you phrase it. To us, it was 
uh, unreached and also like like likely not to survive you yeah. know or or in danger or something like that and so our heart is to one day adopt a girl from India hmm. because it's unreached and uh you know there's a lot of girls in India being born that go into human trafficking yeah. and things like that so um yeah you're doing it and you've also adopted tell us about your family uh married and you got four kids now yeah so uh, I've been married for you're not supposed to pause when you do this. Okay. I, I think 15 years now, um, and I have. Wait, wait, wait. You get, you've already paused, and then you also said, "I think." Right. Okay. Well, it's just Is been it so. It's been so blissful that I mean, <laughs> some days it feels like it just happened, and other days we are soulmates for life. Right. Yeah. So, it feels like an eternity. Yeah. Is so that what you're saying? I can say 2003. I know that. I was trying to do the math backwards. Yeah. No, it's 15. As we're maybe? Teetering on the 18, 19, what that worked. But yeah, so 15 yeah. years, we've got four kids, uh, a 13-year-old daughter, Lola, a 10-year-old son named Justice, which works great in my line of work. Yeah. Um, and, oh, then, uh, and then uh, over the last several years, we started fostering yeah. and uh, local um, foster care providers for our county. And uh, we're not great at it because we keep them. It's called a foster fail. Yeah. And I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but yeah. the, the ultimate goal of foster care is to provide a safe place while families are rebuilding. Yeah. We believe that... Reunification we, yeah, of the family. Absolutely. And in the extreme circumstances where that's not able to happen, we landed in one of those situations and our littles, yeah. um, who are now three and two, uh, are biological sisters. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And what are their names? Uh, Nia and Winnie. Nia yeah. and Winnie. She'll tell you Winnie Sisters. Sue because her yes. middle name is after my mom. And so she's Winnie Amazing. Sue. I'm yeah. Winnie Sue. I'm yeah. two and I'm a unicorn. Those are the three things you need to know about Winnie Sue. Yeah. And so they were Minnesota uh, mm -hmm. born and here uh, and you adopted them when? Um, so the story with Nia, um, we got licensed as a foster care provider on a Wednesday. And on a Friday, we got a call and said, hey, we have a newborn. And I was like, well, that works a lot faster than biological. Yeah. Um, and so wow. we, we so showed up. a nine-month window. Yeah, seriously, there was no, like, um, there was no nesting happening. Yeah. Uh, we show up on a Monday with a, uh, our driver's license, and they literally gave us a child. No. Um, and uh, a really interesting um, experience because my wife is beaming. Uh, both my wife and I are Christ followers. And in our spiritual journey, my wife sees everything that happens as God ordains all of these things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so she's thrilled. She's known we're going to uh, foster, adopt something. So this is just the culmination. I, on the other hand, was crying. And she's like, are you so happy? And I said, no, I'm crushed at the brokenness of humanity yeah, yeah. that Somebody had a child and they just took that child away from that person. And then they pointed to these people who took a few classes and just said, take this human. Yeah, yeah. The, what kind of brokenness has to precipitate that experience, that experience was really hard for me. Yeah. Um, and hard all the way through adoption. I love my littles. I love them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was a very difficult internal process around things like justice, the structure of the family, the brokenness of our communities, um, issues of race and how we interact with one another. All of those things are not as neat and tidy when you jump into it. So you asked me, when I adopted, so we've we've had Nia since she uh, since she was born. born She's yeah. never left our home. We adopted her. I, I want to say about a year and a half later, and yep. then shortly thereafter, they called and said, "Hey, your daughter has a sister. Would you be An older sister? Younger, younger. So she birth mom got pregnant again. Got it. And yeah. because of the situations happening. Um, they wanted to know if we would take the young girl. And through a couple of different things, we didn't end up having Winnie come live with us until she was six months old. And uh, But then she also never left. And uh, we adopted her last May. This is fun. Last May the 4th. Yeah. Um, so we had a Star Wars theme. Yeah. Adoption, May the 4th. May the 4th. Yes. Yep. Our fourth child, May the 4th be with us. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's crazy. a little bit of the story. And uh, I'm I'm not making a joke, uh, but it sounds like I'm making a joke. If this mom gets pregnant again, is there any chance like that you would take another child? Like how, how does it? Yeah. Like are you connected with this family? Yeah. And again, I'm I don't know the foster care system super well, but. No, and, and it's a really common question, yeah. first of all, from our parents and our family. Like, are you just going to keep yeah, taking like we kids? Keep doing this, yeah. Um, and honestly. 
I think the best answer is we're going to try to be o- as obedient as possible. Yeah. There's there's one thing where it's just a standalone foster care child that needs housing. It's another thing when it is a biological sibling of your daughter's. Yeah. And so, yeah, we would we would talk um, and pray about it. Yeah. Um, and probably Candace and I would make that decision before I would announce it on a podcast. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will for sure do it. Right. I haven't talked to my wife, but uh, we're going to do it. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. No, totally. We've definitely talked about that, and uh, we we are in relationship with Birth Mom, yeah. and um, I think all parties at this point believe that this is the best road for Winnie and Nia, yeah. and then we will uh, move forward from there. Yeah, amazing. But they are now your daughters. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, we could do a whole podcast on how thrilled yeah. I am about foster care, adoption, how much better uh, our family is. We just function better. I I was a decent dad of two. Yeah. I don't think I was a rock star. Y- you might be a rock star. I thought I was going to be a rock star dad. You know, I don't feel like a rock star. <laughs> and I, and I yeah. know I wasn't. I know as I got older, I, I never hit my kids. I never berated them. But you know what? Football got really important. And I was like, man, I should be the guy that's out playing with his kids instead of really wanting to watch a football game. And so parenting revealed a lot of my selfishness. Yeah. And when we got to foster, it was like this moment where I'm like, oh, I can I can do better, right? And it not just better for the littles, but better for all four of my kids. Yeah. And so Candace and I are a better team. Our bigs are just better citizens. They're better yeah. humans. They take such good care of the littles. Yeah. And I can tell you, I have more love in my heart having four kids than two. Hands down, I am uh, a better man, husband, and dad because of um, the not just the littles, but all four of my kiddos. It's awesome. Uh, I a while back I read uh, a snippet that Eugene Peterson wrote about um, living a life of congruence and um, congruence meaning that that two things line up, they're congruent. They I, I don't know the right definition, but they match, they line up. That's mm-hmm. that's what it is in my head. But um, I'm a simple mind, Paul. So <laughs> congruent uh, meaning that what you talk about. And what you present yourself as publicly, uh, the the life that you live in business or as a pastor in ministry, um, just your public persona uh, that that it, that you would live a life of congruence, uh, like it's actually who you are privately, and right. as you live your life like um, in your home and your family, um, and also that those two things, so your public life, your private life also are congruent with the word of God. Right. So it's like those three things you talk about Venn diagram that you yeah. land in the middle of those three circles and you are somebody, you've always been this way in my mind that you live a life of congruence, like true congruence to, am I living out what the Bible says? Like, and that's how you tr- have chosen to live your life. You've challenged me uh, in a lot of ways, just as I've watched your life from a distance, but also in one-on-one settings, uh, congruent to the Bible, but also just the public life that you live now leading venture. Um, and you've been there for eight years. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Something like that. Uh, the public life of venture and your private life, family life, um, how you're living, I guess it's not private, like pretty public, like with your family and how you live and encouraging other people, but just all those three things, you're living a congruent life. And I guess my question and part of the purpose of having you here is to talk about the journey of how you got to where you're at now or of the last 10 years since I've known you, um, because, and this is a side story, but we, we worked at a church together in yep. Texas yeah. and that's where I met you. And, uh, we had gone to the same school in Minneapolis, North central university, uh, which I know you love. We could talk about all this stuff, but I'd love to talk your journey of to ha- have you always been this person that's lived this congruent life? Um, or have you had moments growing up, uh, in high school, college, um, talk about your family life, but, uh, how did you get to be this congruent? Because, and the reason I'm taking a little bit of time in this question is because I I know a lot of people and I've seen a lot of people that their public persona and what they talk about, preach about, you know, all that is very much different than how they are in meetings or privately or with their family. Um, it's just different and it's not a life of congruence. And even worse, sometimes it's not even 
biblical how they would live their life. Right. It's not a slam on anybody, but it's just I've seen people live a different life than how you're living. And that's one of the things I appreciate most about you. And so uh, it's a long setup right. to say, how did you get to this place? So um, first of all, that's super kind, right? And I don't want to deflect the compliment, but maybe to add... Uh, whatever congruence that you see, that you perceive, that you've experienced is at very best a work in progress. I yeah. think the congruence that we see in anybody is birthed out of our ability to recognize our own incongruity. Yeah, but that's that's what I'm saying. To me, it's like you're you you know your work in progress, and publicly in any setting, you're oh, letting see, you're everybody saying, know. See, I thought you were saying I'm really no, great no, in no, public and you're private. You're saying I'm jacked up in no. public and jacked up, so it's congruent. Basically, yeah. Basically, no. no I'm saying like that's what's awesome, and right. and even biblically, it's like this is a journey. Life's a journey, right? And it's okay not to be perfect, and right. don't walk into church thinking you got everything thing together. Don't walk into your business. Don't like, right. and that's how you live your life. It's like, no, we're all working on this thing. So if we, to answer your question, to back it up, um, a, a little bit of my journey, I don't necessarily, I probably land a little bit where you do. I'm a simple person, right? Yeah. Uh, I find life most fulfilling when things line up, when yeah. things are in order, um, when I can push away some of the peripheral stuff and go, hey, here are the main things, when I can keep going back to what the main things are. Yep. Um, and so for for Candace and I, our, our familial journey and our organizational and vocational journey, our spiritual journey, when those line up, that's the best yeah. for me. I function at the highest level with that. So if we back up in the story... Um, if we if we look at foster care, foster care for my wife was birthed out of her prayer time, out yep. of her compassion. Foster care for me was a little bit more out of um, a, an incongruence and a practitioner uh, desire. And what mm. I mean by that is, uh, well, let me back up even more. When I worked at a church, uh, when I worked at a church, one of the questions that Candace and I would ask is, what does it look like when we're not paid to be a Christian? Hmm. What do our kids know of us as Christ followers that they're not learning from a really great building on the side of the highway? Wow. We've been a part of great churches with great ministries and great pastors, and there are moments in my life where I literally, there was a, a, a children's pastor, I don't know if he was there when you were there, but Pastor Vance, and I had this moment where I was like, ah, Pastor Vance has more influence on my kid's spiritual journey right now than I do. I got to take more ownership of that. Wow. Um, so that began some things that Candace and I did. And then the other question as a pastor was, who are we outside of what we're getting paid to do? Yeah. And that got us started in justice work. Um, mm. And that got me connected with venture. I'd always been a fan of venture. It started from some students in a university that I went to and worked at. Yeah. And, uh, and that journey then um, created a door to open up for my wife and I to climb Mount Kilimanjaro with Venture. Yes. And that, I mean, it's a, it's a great story. It's a great experience. But we at the, uh, literally on the top of the tallest freestanding mountain in the world, Mount Kilimanjaro, um, we had this moment where we, we were physically spent. And we decided that this is a really great experience of what it means to give ourselves fully for other people. Mm. Because we can feel deeply for people. We can feel bad for them. We can have compassion. But Isaiah invites us to give ourselves more fully than that yeah. on behalf of other people, because that's what Jesus did for us, right? And so we went back home after that trip and said, we've got to look for more opportunities to give ourselves fully. Yeah. Ended up joining uh, Venture. That was a, a long decision. On some levels, it was a very easy one because we loved Venture, very difficult because the church that we served at was an incredible church and an incredible group of friends and faith community. Um, but then we got here, and a few years into working with Venture, a justice organization, I was like, well... Well, now am I going to do? Yeah. You, you know, now, now you're who am paid I? To, yeah. Now I'm paid to do the justice stuff, right? Yeah. And so again, now remember, Candace, in her mind, foster care, adoption—that's a thing. We're we're doing this, yeah. and I kept putting it on hold. And then we started asking, "What does it look like?" Kind of two questions for us to be a neighbor, yeah, and for us to do justice as yeah. a family, not what I'm paid to do. Uh, and that brought us to we live in. Um, the urban core of Minneapolis, and yep. the need for foster care is great. Uh, it's quadrupled over the last decade. Really? And we... That's legit. It's... Yeah. 
four times yeah, in the last 10 years. That was that was some of the numbers that we heard through the class. And wow. my, my wife, Candace, just said, let's just take the introductory class. It's one class. I'm like, that's a step we can take to begin to, nobody's paying, nobody's celebrating us. We told nobody we were doing it. It's a decision that you and I, as a husband and wife, are just making to investigate, is this congruent and is this obedient to what our family's supposed to do for the kingdom, but then also just as citizens, because Christ followers in the kingdom aren't the only people that are doing foster care and adoption. Yeah. So th- yeah. this is just a good citizen move, yeah. right? And so anyway, speed it up. We took all the classes, and uh, and that's how we ended up with Nia and Winnie. And what we didn't know at the time was how much that would change our whole family. Yeah. It, it changes everything. It changes uh um, for those who are listening, uh, you're listening to a white person yeah. um, who adopted two black children. Yeah. And it's the first time I realized, oh, all of our dolls are white. All of our books are white. Yeah. You know, all of our children, all the pictures. Yeah. And now there is a great growing trend of diversity in literature and children's yeah. literature and, and all of that. But but it was it, it opened our eyes on how to be just better um, uh, citizens and Christ followers. Yeah, man, that's everything that you just said is crazy. And I mean, we could even talk about living, you live in North Minneapolis. I live in North Minneapolis as of this recording and we're getting ready to move because of our job transition down, down to Apple Valley. Uh, but uh, very similar Apple Valley and North. It's the same, pretty same much the different. same thing. Yeah. yeah. No. So it is different uh, for us, but we, uh, we love living in North and, and even just the whether it's the political climate, all that we could talk about diversity if we wanted to, um, but where where yeah where you're hap- where you guys are doing ventures doing things around the world, um, and also what you guys are doing in your family is uh, I mean a lot of it you won't like me saying it but it's just heroic like all of this I I, I view you as one of the most courageous people that I know uh, bold because you're secure in who you are. Uh, you don't need to impress anybody. You're not confident in the flesh. Uh, I think I, I would say that you're confident because of who God created you to be. It's amazing. Um, but talk about your journey into, um, I, I guess, where did the care for being a person that, uh, you know, who are we when we're not paid to be pastors? Yeah. Who are we when we're not paid to be doing justice? But your journey into that, did you always want to be this type of person? Uh, or or did, was there moments in college, moments in high school? Is it how you were raised? Um, because there's people listening right now, they go, I don't really want to serve food at a food, sh- food right. shelf. I don't really care about what's happening on the other side of the planet. Uh, you know, I, I really care about making a good amount of money, uh, setting on my family, uh, you know, and children that me and my wife made, you know, like, like that, that's people listening. And I think there's a hurdle for us to get over that we weren't made for our own pleasure. We weren't made for just, you know, to make sure that we're set and comfortable, all this. Uh, but I think, uh, it's it's like the old uh, Shane and Shane song. This and and you know him, but he he wrote this song. He said, "Lord, I want to yearn for you." Yeah, and he explains it. He's saying, "I I wrote that at a place that I didn't yearn for God." Right. There's people listening. They go, "I don't I don't want to do." the life life that you're living. You know, I don't really care about matching up my life biblically, um, but I I want to want to care. That I love that yeah. you brought that up. I don't know if you remember the song, you and I both grew up in kind of church yeah, yeah. settings, and there was a song, You're All I've Ever Wanted, You're All yes. I Ever Need. And I can literally, Can't my person, I couldn't, I could only go, You're All I Want to Want. Yes. You, you know what I mean? I have to add that thing. So kind of what Shane and Shane, this journey, um, yeah. and different people approach their authenticity, their obedience, their congruence in different ways. For me, I feel very agitated when I feel fake or when I feel like I'm trying to squeeze myself into somebody else's mold. Uh, But that being said, around this issue of justice, compassion, care, being a neighbor, all things that almost everybody agrees um, is a good thing. They might not all do it the same way. They might not all even want to. Uh, There are plenty of Thanksgivings where we've served at a at a, um, a food shelter, and I didn't want to. I yeah. know that I might get fired from my job, people hearing that, but I'd rather watch football. <laughs> Nobody's fired so, you. 
So being honest about my incongruity and the yeah, yeah. power to make a decision, even when you don't want to, because yeah, yeah. lots of people care, but honestly, caring doesn't actually change the life of the person in front of you. We have to move from care to something else. Yeah. Um, in addition to, we talk at Venture, um, clicking like on Facebook doesn't actually do anything for anybody. Yeah. Now, I think there's great social movement, social awareness. I think those are powerful things. But for the the young girls who are vulnerable to being trafficked in, in some of the communities in Nepal, 70% yeah. are going to be trafficked into Nepal and India where they're going to have to do unspeakable things 20 and 30 right, times right, a day. Right. Feeling bad for them doesn't do anything. Yeah. It doesn't. And so having to move myself from where I'm at to something less comfortable on behalf of other people, that's my gauge. Yeah. So if I back up to when I moved to Minneapolis to go to school, it was... Uh, a couple of decades ago now. And at that time, what we were taught... You still and, look young, you know? Thank you. <laughs> I'm serious. So at that time, how we interacted with the urban core was a very be safe mentality. And so the school, for very good reasons, would say things like, if somebody on the street asks you for money, don't give them money. They're going to use it for drugs, cigarettes, or alcohol, right? right, that, right that's right. what they're going to say. And, and for probably two or three years, I just listened to that because I'm good at following authority. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I feel like I should do. I got to this point where at one point somebody asked and I said no, and I walked away and I said, every time I say no, I am judging that person. Yeah. I'm making a judgment on how they're going to use the money that I have that I, as a college student, wasn't even earning at that point. Yeah, yeah. And I was making a judgment and it and it and I felt like it put a schism between me and that person, yeah. between me and other humans, other humanity. And I just started going, you know what? I'm just going to practice giving and let them make the choices they want to make and me make the choices. And, and that was a start. Now, to be honest, I felt like kind of a, a fake, like yeah. I never thought of myself as the justice guy. Speed up. I was a resident director at a college. I remember putting on an event where we slept outside on the coldest night of the year to kind of empathize and have solidarity with those like our um, Native American brothers and sisters yep. in Tent City right now. And yep. just that can crush you that you we just drive by and we go to our homes that have heat and our cars that have heat. And we go, oh, that's sad because they're in a tent. Sad doesn't do anything. So right. we were trying to do something. I don't think we raised barely any money. I don't know what it did. Yeah. I kind of felt like, who do I think I am trying to do something about this? Yeah. But those steps, those steps of relative anonymity, those steps of relative um, little impact began to change my heart to align it with an obedience to what I believe the Spirit was calling me to do, yeah. was leading me to just care and turn that care into action. And even when I didn't care, to have obedience move into action. And I look through scripture and the parts that come so alive to me are, when we get to heaven, here's what it says as they're shifting and sifting who goes where, the rubric is, what did you do with the least of these? What did yeah. you do with somebody who asked for food? What did you do with somebody who needed something to um, wear? What did you do with somebody who was, uh, you know, the widows, the orphans, the those who are in prison? These are very real things that we yeah. have segregated and said that's for a certain group of people within Christendom to take care of. Yeah. And it, it couldn't be further from the truth. We yeah. all have to regularly... I'm going to pause and then I'm going to turn it back over to yeah. you. We all have to regularly decide what we're going to do. And this isn't to make somebody feel guilty. Right. Hopefully it's to empower them that we can make a choice even when we don't feel like it. Yeah. We can be obedient even when we'd rather be less comfortable. One of the reasons why I love the mo the venture model is because it invites people to go from comfortable to less comfortable. Yeah, yeah. It's the only way that our neighborhoods will be better. It is the only way that as citizens we will engage is when we quit looking out for number one yeah. um, and we willingly move from comfortable to less comfortable. There's a Jewish story or interpretation, a teaching that yeah. if somebody has two cloaks and another person doesn't have a cloak, the, the lesson isn't give your cloak. The lesson is you've stolen the other cloak. Like, Interesting. It's not just your opportunity to give to be a generous person. It is a your moral contract, your citizen contract, your neighbor contract is how can you walk around with two when somebody else doesn't have one? You have somehow, wow. the system has stolen that coat 
um, from this person. And um, so back to us, we're simply trying to get more congruent with the needs we see in the world and how we live that out connected to our beliefs and then as a family doing it together. What would you say to somebody uh, that is listening and they're in the, I, I, I want to want yeah. to help people. I want to, you know, like you even mentioned Tent City. How many people, and even myself, and I've heard people, it's like drive by that. That's in Minneapolis. It's a homeless community that's kind of started to grow out of nowhere. Uh, now that it's getting cold and I haven't driven by it in a little while. But um like people that drive by that and they, they go, man, that that's sad. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they don't even, they, they don't even want to do something. About right. It, you know what I'm saying? So what are some steps people can take or just processes, uh, like people could think through in getting over the hurdle of, I want to want to do something Yeah. to, I, I actually want to do something now. Yeah. You know what? It's a great, as we are in a holiday season, um, it's a great time where we celebrate generosity and whether somebody's listening to it right now or they're listening to it from a year from now, the steps that we want to take is towards being a compassionate human being. One of the easiest practical things that we have done um, at different seasons in our life is having granola bars in our car. And just when you see people on the side of the road and you don't have to wait until you see somebody with a cardboard sign that says help, but to just be practice giving, to to just practice giving. Um, You are going to have to take steps um, into something less comfortable. It's, it can be awkward. Um, it can be, you you know, we talk about tent city. Uh, you're like, well, I don't really know what they would want or if I can just show up. I guarantee if you show up with a big old, you know, grab bag of 10 white castle, whatever the crave something sliders there, (laughs) there it is, or Taco Bell or, or Chipotle. It'll be or, going in a second. Yeah, and and uh, and to practice that generosity, to practice, um, and practice means you're an athlete. Um, practice means that sometimes we're not gonna. It's not gonna be a home run. You you can't go from you and me to call it Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. Without practice, right? Yeah. Um, there's this whole process, and yet we we only want to make decisions if it makes sense and if we look good. Yeah. Um, or, at, or if it's the most epic thing of all time. Right. Yeah. Right. And the reality is, is what does it look like to to just practice? What does it yeah, look yeah. like? And the final thing is, so my worldview is there's good and evil. And yep. good is Christ and evil is the dark forces of Satan. If, if I'm trying to pursue doing good... I, it makes logical sense that evil is trying to keep me from that. And yeah. the way I know evil wow. works in my life is whispering things in my head. You're insignificant. That didn't matter. You're going to look stupid. White privilege. You're this. You're ignorant. All of those yeah, yeah. things. When we have scripture and we have just uh, the human condition to say, no, I care. I'm going to try as hard as I can. If I screw up, I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. But uh, the the phrase, uh, and maybe I'll just give this to anybody who's going, here's a phrase that you should keep in the back of your head, in light of. It's what we teach um, our kids. My daughter yeah. wants an iPhone. Yeah. She's 13. She's yeah. not getting one. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, no, spoiler no, alert. No, yeah. no problem with other people who who have their kids have one. But yeah. my, my, my daughter said, all of my friends have iPhone 10s. She calls them X's. I'm like, that's 10. Yeah, that's um, 10 and yeah. and uh, my response to her was two things. First of all, I said, well, hang out with poorer friends because not everybody that's 13 yeah, yeah. has an iPhone 10. And then two, in light of. In light of is this phrase that in light of what I have and in light of what I see around me, what am I doing? Yeah. So when I see people living in a tent and I know that I have cupboards full of food, in light of that incongruity, what can I do? Yeah. Um, And so in light of allows us to connect our situation with the situation around us and then make a decision. Yeah. In light of and practice, practice, turn it, don't turn it into something that's like, uh, yeah, you would, you, I think athletics and you love sports and you love the Packers, right? I, I did go with a neutral. I didn't say Kirk Cousins and I didn't say Aaron Rodgers. I said Tom Brady to stay neutral, but yes, I love the Packers. You love the Packers. Just be real, man. All right. All right. I was just trying to be nice. (laughs) No, it's nice. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't say, man, I'm only gonna try football if it means I'm gonna win the Super Bowl. Like you right. like you no, I'm gonna go to practice. 
and I'm going to do this thing for years and, and if, see how far it goes, you know? So it's kind of like generosity, giving, making a difference, getting uncomfortable is just saying, let's try it. Let's see how far it goes, you know? Yeah. And so uh, little things, I think You know, the great. difference there, I know I'm jumping on what you said. The difference no. is very few, it's, it's less than 1% of all football players make the NFL. Yeah. Every single person that practices the principles in scripture will have a better life. Every single, it's 100%. Great. So you practice those wow. principles. It's not just going to impact other people. It's going to impact us. Yeah, yeah. I was... Um, yeah, thinking, you have 100%, 100%. certainty. Yeah, it doesn't as mean... as you practice uh, generosity, making a difference, doing justice, acting on just whether it's you're feeling bad or compassion or... But acting on it, it's 100% chance that it's going to change your life. 100%. Whereas if you start practicing football... It's less than a 1% chance. That's exactly it. And if you're over 20, it's a 0% chance. That's right. If you're starting. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty I'm pretty athletically gifted. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really built and yeah. I'm really athletic yeah, yeah. and super coordinated. Yeah, if so. you're listening to this, he's massive. He, I, massive. Yeah, yeah. I barely fit in If you're this watching chair. on YouTube, you uh, <laughs> can just see the sarcasm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, I I was I've been thinking about um, a passage, John 2, yep. and in, it's one of Jesus's first signs, and the, the for, not one of, his first sign, and he, he changes water to wine. Yep. And growing up, I grew up in a home where my dad was an alcoholic before I was born, and I went to a church where they believed in 100% abstinence from alcohol. So yep. this, this story was simply a story that was he turned something from one thing to another. It didn't have really anything to do with yeah. the alcohol base. And, and I don't actually think the story has to do with alcohol. I, but what it has to do with is there's this wedding. And at the wedding, they give a certain level of wine in the beginning and then a lower level at the end. And they ran out. And yeah. Jesus changes the water not only to wine, not only fixes the brokenness, mm. but gives, makes it the best wine. So it totally surprises everybody. Yeah, yeah. And in this story, I, when I read scripture, sometimes I try to figure out who am I in the story. Yeah. Am I like the bride and groom? Am I Jesus? Am I Mary? Am I the people attending the wedding? Who am I? Yeah, yeah. And I think in that story, we're all the wine. Yeah. We're the plan that Jesus has. So the wine is something that adds richness and flavor. It, yeah. it adds the celebration. Um, yep. It solidifies the sacred nature of this covenantal um, experience between the bride and the group and the community because it's all connected. It's all yep. pointing to the kingdom. But for us, we're in this process from water to wine. And the closer we get to wine, not only... Not only do we become who we're supposed to be, but we're yeah. going to surprise the guests yeah. and we're going to add value and richness. And if we continue to practice obedience, to practice generosity, to practice doing justice and being humble, because those two things go right alongside of one another. If we practice those things, not only do we become a better version, yeah. we become that wine, but that wine adds value to the community around us, the richness Amazing. that the church needs to represent the kingdom with. Yeah, and I think I think uh, just adding on that is Jesus is the one that did it, and I think connected to obviously we we both sit here and we love the Lord and love the gospel message and would want that for anybody, but that yeah connected to something bigger than yourself and more than just I want to do good uh, like for humanity's sake, but I want to do good for like in Jesus name. I think that that is what helps us become the best wine. So I think they're like separated from it. You can have a little bit of transforming power and do good on planet earth and uh but to become the best version of who God wanted you to be and to actually make that best like greatest impact in people's lives. Uh, th this is like the pastor coming out of me, but like, yeah. like to, it's connected to who Jesus is. The one that created you is going to be the one that turns you into the best wine, the best version of yourself possible, the most effective possible. I love that you just said that, like turning it back to Jesus is the one that does this. When we do yeah. it, we might make some incremental steps. Like we might go from water to like LaCroix, right? <laughs> Just this subtly yes, better. Yes. But if you remember the first time, I know LaCroix is super trendy and yeah, but everybody now it loves has, it. I think they now have pesticides. Uh, yeah. And if you, you whether you like <laughs> it or so not funny. right now, if you go back to the first time you drank LaCroix, 
That yeah. stuff is nasty, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, but we've all kind of settled into this as, as, hey, we're just a little bit better than water. And I don't know if you, I was looking at some memes on LaCroix, yeah, yeah. and uh, one person said, LaCroix is like your best friend ate fruit salad and then burped into your soda. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's just nasty. And I, I think... I think sometimes we go, hey, I want to start this Christian journey. I want to be a Christ follower. Yeah. Um, and, but we just take these such uh, these steps where we um, we're out of fear or out of hesitation or out of we want to succeed so bad that it, it yeah. paralyzes us from taking risks. Yeah. And what you said, if we stay near the vine as the branch, then Jesus yeah. will transform us. Our lives will be richer and yeah. our community will be richer. Um, but it takes taking that step, that that going from comfortable to less comfortable, yeah. which is, you know, what what we're trying to do not only in my home, but with, with venture. With venture, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's great. You you mentioned that your dad, before you were born, was alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about, yeah, you grew up in Wisconsin. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, talk about what, what it was like when you were a boy, um, family life, faith life, uh, were you raised in church? Um, yeah. And if not, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, so my dad my dad came back from serving in one of the wars, and the combination of the trauma that that created with some life choices that he was making um, created a scenario where when he got married to my mom, it was just kind of a train wreck waiting to happen. There was a lot of things. Mm. And um, uh, it's it's a really long story, but literal miraculous events that created an opportunity for my mom and dad to make a decision to allow Christ to not only reconcile their individual lives, um, but to redeem their marriage. And so they started wow. taking these these steps. And uh, Green Bay is the number one binge drinking city in America. No, and um, so my. They had to make some really strong decisions, and so they went total abstinence, teetotalers, really? um, found a church that also believed in that way. And so for me growing up, I did grow up in the church. I grew up in a home where I was very well cared for. My parents loved me. I watched mm. them working on their own lives and making their own lives better. I saw a team. It was great. Um, but growing up in, in Green Bay, because of the alcohol issue specifically, there was a, a, a huge um, disconnect uh, between yeah. myself and everybody else. You know, if you yeah. grew up in one tradition where they where they don't want anything to do with alcohol and it villainizes it, and then you grew up in a city where it's everybody's number one drinking. Binge. Yeah. yeah, it just it, it was definitely creating it created an us and them mentality. Yeah, um, and so when I went to school. Uh, I went to a university that was right in the heart of a major city and had to begin to reconcile, do I want to keep being separate from everything always? Or where I landed was I felt like God was calling, how do we make bridges? Yeah. How do we build bridges to our neighborhood, to our neighbors? How do we build yeah. bridges to communities, to businesses, to people in need, even if they don't agree with our belief structure, yeah. even if they're never going to join my team? Yeah. Um, what does it look like to just... Do what Scripture says and love our neighbor. And yeah. so uh, lots of things. My parents were a huge part of that story. The university that I went to, the denomination I grew up in, all very positive experiences. But none of them in and of themselves complete. Yeah. All of them left me needing to go back to Scripture and saying, what is my obedience? What is my obedience to the kingdom? And that's taken our journey um, not away from any of the previously talked about things, but uh, including other other areas. Uh, we attend a Methodist church now, which yeah. is not the denomination that I grew up in. Uh, we live in a part of the city that I'd never lived in before because of Answering a question about what is our obedience, we've yeah. adopted. And these aren't all yay us's. What I would love for who's ever listening or watching to know is these are just steps. Yeah. They're steps. I mean, I can list all of the things that I've done wrong over the last week as well. Um, I'd rather be a bit more encouraging saying while we're wrestling with the things we've done wrong, we can keep making steps yep. towards the kingdom. Um, did you, uh, in, in in the process of... Uh so saying, I don't want to live my life separate from the world or the community that I live in. I don't want to be, I don't want to have this us versus them mentality. I think that that is actually, it runs rampant in the church in America where there's a separateness. It's, it, and, but it's disguised as, well, we, 
w- being like Jesus is separate than mm-hmm. the world and it's disguised as, well, we're light in the dark. So the light looks, it's a huge contrast to, you know what I'm saying? Like, but really what it does is build, it builds walls instead of bridges, you know? So mm-hmm. I see it all the time. Um, you know, when you move to a part of the city that you move into, um, when you adopt these children that have a different skin color than you do, uh, when uh, you jump denominations, uh, go to the Methodist church, um, where there are people in your life that are saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to pray away your tough neighbors, or I'm going to pray away that you don't, uh, you know, you don't don't want to live in that part of the city anymore. Or I, are you sure you want to do this foster care thing? Or are you sure you want to jump denominations? Or you know, there's, you know, the the conversation I think about is, um, you know, uh, ex- ex- this is. Uh, feels like I'm going to jump topics, but, uh, it's kind of in the same thread, like ex- extreme Islam, like, like, and, and so I know a bunch of Christians that their language towards, uh, Muslims is so anti, I mean, essentially anti those people, yet they're humans that God created that mm-hmm. we should care for, love for, pray for, be in relationship with, pursue, especially in Minneapolis. Like, I mean, we live here and there's a huge Muslim population, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so in your living this way and taking these steps, uh, again, you're not saying, hey, I'm a hero for doing this. I would say that because, again, it's different than some of the Christians that I see. But was there opposition to these moves that you made in life? And how, what's your response to that? Obviously, your response is you do it anyways. Yeah. Uh, but there's people listening that would pray away. Don't live in that neighborhood. Yeah. Don't engage those people. Don't go show up to the protest when somebody gets shot by police. Don't show up because you're, you know, now you're anti-police, you know? Yeah. So obviously these are hot button, but right. hot button issues. Uh, but I just, yeah, your courage in the face of that. I think for my wife and I, our, our driving principle is to love our neighbor. And so some of the different groups or issues that you talk about, when we turn them into a group or an issue, that's easier to villainize. When yep. their neighbor... You, you know, when their neighbor, that's a different thing. My my neighbor is somebody I know their name, I know their story. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean every neighbor is a safe person, but it means that every neighbor isn't a group, isn't yeah. a stereotype, isn't a thing. So, so understanding neighbor drives us. You know, in our process, I think we've been very supported and have been very encouraged. There are plenty of people that don't fully understand. Yeah. There are plenty of people that ask questions, but but that's okay because. Because they don't, their obedience doesn't have to be our obedience. And my job isn't to convince somebody. It's yeah. to be able to have a conversation, a dialogue. Um, because I can, my job is not to get everybody to move to my neighborhood. My job is, um, with the way I live, to encourage people to be good neighbors. And yeah. so not everybody can be a neighbor in my neighborhood. Um, they have to be neighbors where they live. And yeah. so that's the genius to me of scripture is that it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. Um, by wh- maybe it, I don't know if I'm saying that right the- if any theologians are no, listening. No, no, I don't know. Uh, it's what I what I would hear you say in that is the conviction that God places on your life and how you should live is unique to you yeah. and you don't feel this pressure to push your conviction on anybody else but no. also to stand strong in what God has asked you to do. Even if somebody's saying, why are you doing that? You, right. you, you may not understand why I'm doing it, but I'm doing it. So it is unique. It's not a one size fit all. I mean, it is a one one size fits all on your path towards heaven yeah. in regards to how you get there and yeah. who you go through to do that. Yeah. I believe that. Um, and I think you would say, fr- maybe phrase it different, but the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So it is kind of a one size fit all to salvation and the road to heaven. Yeah. Uh, but on this planet, God's going to ask you to live a different way than other people. And I think, uh, and I'm kind of interrupting your response to this, the way that I'm answering it is we need to be careful that the convictions that you have in your heart as a Christ follower, that that we're not putting those convictions on other people, you know, or to pray away uh, how God's asked somebody else to live yep. because you care about them or you you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um so anyways, yeah, I think, I think sometimes we get caught up celebrating um, the act that somebody did or villainizing it when the 
what I think we can agree on is we can celebrate when somebody does love their neighbor, mm -hmm. regardless of who that neighbor is. We can celebrate when somebody is generous. We can yeah. we can celebrate when somebody does move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of other people. Um, and we can celebrate those in multiple places in our community and around the world. Yeah. And I, I think when humanity, or very specifically when I'm weak, what I want is other people to validate what I'm doing. And when we need other people to validate what we're doing, doing, then we are always subject to their interpretation of what we're doing. Now, yeah. I think we should have um, a board, a personal board of directors that yeah. helps guide us, that helps work through different um, challenges, Great. different decisions that we make. I absolutely believe in that. But but ultimately, the choices that we make, that's what we're going to be accountable for. Yeah. And, um, and that's why we go back to the Scripture really clearly, when we're doing justice, when we're trying to step out, we're also supposed to be humble. We're supposed to approach things with a humility that says, we're not going to always get it right. And maybe we are getting it right, and that doesn't mean somebody else is getting it wrong. Yeah. Um, so what is our obedience? Uh, Ryan Skoog, a good friend of ours who uh, is the president of Venture, um, he talks a lot about we don't judge and we don't join. Yeah. Um, and, and that's an organizational mantra. So to keep us clear on what we're doing, what we feel God's called us to do, we're not going to judge if somebody does it differently. But yeah. that also means we don't have to join them yeah. if somebody... Now, we. We collaborate with lots of organizations totally. and groups, but in terms of our methodology, yeah. if we can, if we don't judge and we don't join, then we can celebrate other people, yep. and we can be um, courageous and humble in the obedience that we are practicing. It's great. I think it's genius. And what you said too about personal board of directors, I I would almost say that everybody, whether they realize it or not, has a personal board of directors. And now somebody listening might say. Well, I don't, I don't really have pe people, but you like, even if it's, even if it's, you know, CNN or Fox news, that might be your personal board of director in how you're viewing the world, how you're living your life, how, you know, so you have voices in your life that are leading you and how, how to live, but it's being intentional. How do you choose who is speaking into your life? Um, yeah. And who, yeah. And who are those voices? Yeah, so I, I would say there's kind of, for me, three tiers. Mm -hmm. The first tier is my wife. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in the sacred covenant of marriage, and I believe that once we covenant together, God gives her things to communicate to me and gives her the ability to see me in the way that nobody else on the planet can. Yep. So she's my starting point. She's my end point. Um, we together figure out what the Herkmans look like. The second... And Kaylee, Kaylee, she's listening, my wife. She's my starting point <laughs> and she's my ending point. <laughs> How long did you get married? And everything in between. Uh, I think... No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. No, we've been married coming up on seven years in January. So That's, it's amazing. I remember the first time I met her and I, I, I was like, I must not know Kirk well enough to be... He must be a really good dude because she looks way too pretty for you. And yeah, yeah. she's she way is. more than just pretty. 100%. She's yeah. just this incredible person. I was like, I don't really get it. Because do you remember no, when I, I used to make 100%. fun of you yes. in the office? Yes. You'd come wearing these crazy clothes and come with on, dude. ripped stuff. I know you're way more trendy than I am. I, t I get Stop it. Stop it. I get it. You, um, so You live in the urban hey, core, Paul. Hey, come on. Er <laughs> <laughs> Board of directors, my wife. Yes. Then secondly, people in close proximity with yes. me. Um, they're not always just people that I choose. Uh, yeah. It can be some people that I believe believe that God brings into my life. So I really believe in authority structures. I, yep. I think scripture is really clear on that. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes we villainize that whole submission thing. And yeah. uh, so like even when I move from one church to another church, I talk to my, my existing pastor. I talk to the head of that denomination. I wanted, I wanted to have a blessing, um, so yeah. to speak. Now, I'm not telling everybody else they need to do that, but I... You can either inform people or invite people. And a mm. lot of times we, when we're making big decisions, we pray, we pray, we pray, and we're like, okay, that's the right decision. Now I'm going to tell everybody why it's the right decision. Yeah. As opposed to inviting them and saying, hey, I'm thinking about this. Could you pray with me on this? Yes. Um, what a great, sorry, just yeah. as a leadership principle, I think there's plenty of leaders that think they're inviting uh, people into a conversation or into a decision, and, and they they think they're collaborating, but really they're just informing because they'll say their opinion first or they'll put a little pressure in their verbiage. Uh, and a great leadership principle is just to think, uh, no, instead of informing them, uh, invite people into yeah. the conversation. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think leaders have to stay at best a half step ahead. I think we put pressure on ourselves to be two and three steps ahead of yeah, the yeah. process. If you're if you're truly 
walking into uncharted territory and you are getting two and three steps ahead of everybody, yep. you've probably left them way too far back. You've yeah, got to lost. stay together yeah. and you should hopefully be hearing from the people around you and from God to be a half step ahead if that's the yeah, mantle yeah. that he has put on you yep. to lead. Um, but they should be pretty close and they should be invited into the process. Yeah, amazing. And th- so that's that's a handful of people. I believe that parents are that. And I know not everybody has a, a functional familial structure, but parents, uh, uh, God chose them. Yeah. And he might not have chose all the choices they made, but so if they have any input, that's great. Um, and then outside of that, my a couple of my coworkers, coworkers and bosses. I'm yep. a licensed minister, so yep. that movement. Um, and then a couple of friends that have done this for a long time, and I specifically, my friends that don't think that myself or Justice um, or Venture walks on water, um, yeah. but just we're just regular people trying to be obedient, and they'll call us on it. Um, and then the third tier outside of that, so my wife and then a, a close circle of people. And then the third tier is something kind of what you alluded to. There are people, voices out there that I don't know personally, but their writings, um, yeah. their their messages, their music, their poetry, those things may have consistently been used in my life. Uh, our former pastor, Pastor Scott Wilson, yeah. um, said the the most important book you'll ever read is the he's, one he's coming next week by the way are you serious uh, yeah he and he, Dylan's gonna be on the podcast but uh, awesome yeah. so I'm gonna, I can't I, wait to hug him I love that so the he said he said the most important book you'll ever read is the book that you read when you needed it wow and I, I just loved that because there are books that I can point to in my life that are like man that really spoke to me it. in yeah. that moment yeah. No doubt. Right now, in in transition for me, I'm reading this book called "The First Ninety Days." Mm-hmm. It's just about it's very it's pretty academic, but because and I wouldn't gravitate towards an academic book, but because it's the season that I'm in, it is so practical and applicable to my life. Like I'm I'm it's like I would say this is my favorite book right now, uh, or in the last year that I've read because it's actually right in the season that I'm in. Yep. Uh, side note, pastoral, uh, this is pastoral, but the Bible is applicable to our lives at all times. Like, so just the most important book you'll ever read is the book that, how do you phrase it? The, the most important book you'll ever read is the book that you read when you needed it. Yeah. And I need the Bible all the time. So, which you didn't even ask me about a scripture, but right now, John 2 oozes out of me because I'm yeah. reading John 2. I'm thinking about water to wine. Yeah. And we look at scripture, at least I do, and I'm always trying to figure out. Who am I in this? Yeah. There, there's only two characters in all of Scripture, Jesus and everybody else. And sometimes we put people into <laughs> levels of, yeah. of spiritually mature. And yeah. there's certainly, I think we can play that game, but the distance between Jesus and everybody, it's Jesus and sinners. Totally. And when we can remember that and just be... I, I'm continually trying to get closer to Jesus. I'm not trying to get further away from being a Pharisee. I'm not trying to get further away from being a leper. I'm not trying to get further away, just closer to Jesus. Yeah, and yeah. and whatever residue falls off of me as I'm in that process, awesome. Which is amazing, yeah. But those are the two characters. That's it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Just that it, it, tagging back to the conversation we had about, like, yeah, it's us versus them or separate. Like, sometimes our focus is uh, the people that are different than us and how we need to make sure we're not becoming like the world or we're not becoming like that person or we're not hanging out. With, like, uh, it's actually just, are we taking steps towards Jesus? Let's just focus on that. Mm-hmm. And how you put it is brilliant. Whatever residue falls uh, off of us along that process, and good thing. And yeah. with that, G- following Jesus isn't just... Jesus, this celestial character way out there, one, he's right next to us, and we're told in Scripture that the Imago Dei, the imprint of God, is in each of us. And so even if somebody isn't a Christ follower, we can see things in them that are redeemed, that are beautiful, that that point us back to the goodness of who God is. And uh, yeah, I think that's been one of the most enlightening things is that I don't have to villainize and put people on one team or the other. I need to clearly make a decision for who I am and who I serve. Yep. I need to be a reflection of the kingdom as I am trying to pray for his kingdom to come fully in my family's life. Yep. I need to create opportunity for other people to join that kingdom. Yeah. Um, but I don't have to spend my life deciding what team everybody's on. Yeah, great. Really great. 
It's awesome. Uh, with venture, and as yeah. we wrap up the conversation too, um, what are what are some of the next steps? And and even with your team, you're a half a step ahead. You're helping lead this organization. Uh, but what are what are some of these next steps and goals? That, you know, for the rest of our lives, there'll be work to do, um, and differences to make in people's lives. Uh, so venture will keep going. But what are some of the things that you're thinking about uh, as we head into 2019? Yeah. Uh, the transition from one year to the next is such a great opportunity. I mean, we have the opportunity to be new every single day. That's what yeah, scripture yeah. says. We can be new every single day. We tend to focus on being new around the flip of a season yeah. um, or the beginning flip of, of a, a month, year. beginning of a year. Yeah. yeah. And so w- with venture, I mean, I just I feel so lucky to work with venture. I feel lucky yeah. to be a part of that story. I got invited to be a part of it, and we're just thrilled at what's going on, um, both the work that we get to do with refugees on the Thai-Myanmar border, uh, what we get to do in Nepal with trafficking victims, um, some of the things that not only we get to do, but we're learning from those communities because the Holy Spirit is saturated and present in those places. Yeah. Um, and so we're excited about the growth that we're seeing there. Um, and then um, organizationally, uh, there's just some great things um, coming down the pike. We have a brand new app that's coming out. And Amazing. Um, this app is uh, a Cadillac version. I don't even know if that's a good phrase, but it is. Everybody's tough. driving Cadillac. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Me, it's a Tesla, man. Matthew Tesla version. You, you talk to Matthew about that. Okay. Um, so yeah. uh, we, uh, um, and this, this will connect. It will allow people to log miles. So, one of the things that we do with Venture is we log miles. We, we mm-hmm. run, we bike, we hike, entry level or epic amounts. But it's just the practice of getting off of the couch and going from comfortable to less comfortable. We're going to put that in the palm of people's hands where they can raise money for a ton of organizations and causes that they care about. Yep. Um, and they'll be able to log miles. It'll connect right to their phone. And then they'll be able to fundraise through that. And technology doesn't excite me like it excites a lot of people. Yep. Scaling what we've learned in venture and giving people the opportunity to take a step outside of what their normal life is on behalf of other people, yeah. well, that's just an opportunity to be more like Christ. That's yeah. what Christ did. Christ yeah. came during this holiday season. We remember that he came from the best place in the universe or yeah. in, the, in the cosmos, yeah. and he came down into a manger. He went to something less comfortable. He experienced everything that we've experienced, Mm. and we get to do that. And we will be most fulfilled when we make a choice to move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of other people. So in 2019, that's the goal, that how do I become less comfortable so that other people's comfort will reveal the kingdom more fully? Yeah, it's great. And that's that's an awesome thing. How How do you also help a whole bunch of other people get a little less comfortable? And, and it's not guilt tripping people, but in this context, we'd be giving them a tool like an app uh, that helps them do that is really, really great. I, uh, and we will wrap up, I promise, but okay. uh, there is, uh, there's something about your, your language that I appreciate so much. And maybe you, maybe there's intention behind it, but um, I haven't heard you say one time in this, well, in, in my whole life, but I've, in this conversation too, you haven't said, uh, my company or my team or my uh, organization or my, like it's it's what we get to do what we're a part of what what venture um, you know in that language and maybe it's because you didn't start venture but speak to the language of me th- this is a leadership lesson M- this is my thing my team my company my you know what I'm doing uh or what I'm leading, but it's, you know, it's more of like what I'm a part of or what we get to do. Um, Is there intention behind it? Um, That's a good, a a good question. And I'm going to, I'm going to think about it without having an awkward radio silence pause. Uh, It's a reminder to me of two things. Um, When I use that language, it's because if there I want to own my role, and I want to own what I have to be obedient to. I yep. definitely want to do that. I think sometimes when we think we are the man or the woman, when we're the person, when we're in charge, even if we are in charge, when we keep reinforcing that, there can put unhealthy pressure on us yep. um, to perform, yep. to succeed, um, mm. and it puts pressure on us to do what's right and wow. good as opposed to 
to be obedient. Wow. And so my obedience, if I own something all the time. <laughs> Yo, this I, is, it's so good. It's so good. I can't, I just, I'm going to laugh, so I have to interrupt you, but it's, that's, that's amazing. Well, and I, I think it's somewhat self-preservation. If I own it, I'm going to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and I'm going to cheat something else because I have to not only be obedient with the venture story, but I have to be obedient with the Herkman story. I have to be obedient with the Paul story. If I'm owning all of those things and trying to do all of those things awesome right now, yeah. um, I won't know which day God's called me to be obedient to what level. Uh, yeah. And so the we part recognizes that, hey, there are other people on the team that are doing awesome things. Yeah. Um, the we part means that I play just a role. Uh, so I, I think of this moment when uh, I attend uh, a Methodist church. I'd never attended. In this church, I sit on wooden pews and uh, yep. not very comfortable, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And I can remember sitting... Well, church is really for our comfort, So, <laughs> which is that's, it's, it must be a terrible church to go to. That would be a great tagline. Uh, yeah. Come to First, first Us <laughs> yeah. Church, because church is for you well, to be really comfortable. For you to be super comfortable. But I was Man, sitting on great. these wooden pews. Uh, it was during um, some tensions that we had in the city, and I was feeling indignant about those tensions. Yeah. And there was a lady in front of me, and I knew that she had experienced these kinds of tensions probably for a good chunk of her life. Yeah. And I, in that moment, I was like, who am I to be indignant yeah. um, when this person is handling herself with, with such grace. And I know that's vague. Wow. And then I backed up, and I was like, in this church, this church was built, the building, before the previous denomination that I, the church that I was at was even started. And wow. the, the point to all of that comes around to this. We are a small piece in a large story. Yes. And so when you're asking about the we part, the we's are all over. The we's of your family, the we's of your company or organization, wherever you work, the we's of your faith community. Then we have we's of our race, yeah. of, of where we call home. We have we's of, um, of humanity on the planet right now that is remarkably different than humanity on the planet 80 years ago or 180 years ago. So yeah. when we quit making ourselves the star, the guy or the gal that's got to get it done, yes. and we go, we have a role. And that role is to be obedient so that the world around us can see the kingdom more clearly. They don't need to see Paul more clearly. They right. need to see the kingdom more clearly. Yes. They, and if what I have to share, if they're only hearing Paul and they don't hear me talk about refugees, if they don't hear about these young girls that are being trafficked that we can do something about, if they don't hear that, if they only hear Paul, then I've, I've missed it because Paul is only supposed to be a through way to the kingdom. That's it. Yeah. An epidemic in in what I see is anxiety and stress and pressure and burden. And what you're what you're saying is, if the language is I I I and it's about me 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 me, uh, you're putting unnecessary pressure and it will collapse and you will cheat something. You're not going to do it well. Um, and yeah, even just yeah, even as a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, like like He's with me. So even I am never just me. It's never just me. Right. I'm actually there's a community within me, and it's God Himself speaking to me. And so um, I'll, I'll hear a lot of language of my thing, my team, my church, my you know whatever it is, my company, um, and. You're exactly right. There are people that use that language that I know that they feel the pressure and they feel like I got to, you know, and even just changing some of the language that comes out of us can actually release some of that pressure and burden. Uh, and you're brilliant. So, yeah, w one I of love the, that. One of the um, phrases that is very popular and I don't I don't have a problem with it. I just don't use it. It's the idea of crushing it. Yeah. And I tell people pretty regularly, I intentionally choose not to crush it. Yes. <laughs> I only want to be obedient. Yeah. Because if I want to crush it, and for those who are listening who want to crush it, especially with this incredible podcast. Yes, it, work hard. Yeah, whatever. You know, I totally get that. But I want to remove pressure from myself to be anything except for obedient. The only wow. way I can be obedient is to stay close to the vine. The only way I stay close to the vine is by crafting time to be in scripture, to be in faith community, and to be a neighbor. And if I can create time to do those three things and I can be obedient for today, then tomorrow 
There's some book that says we'll take care of itself. There's some book that says he cares about sparrows, he'll care about me, you know, those types of things. Yeah, yeah. Some book you should... You should look I think it up. that same book. No, I think the same book says even young people get tired and get weary, but those who wait upon the Lord will be given fresh strength yep, I, and rise up on wings like you. I read that book. Have you read it? Yeah, Great. it's a good one. Amazing. Uh, it's awesome. I appreciate you so much, and I'm really grateful. And hopefully, this helps people that are listening. Uh, and if you are listening and it has helped you, uh, this is legit. Please. Write a comment if it's on YouTube or or just respond on Instagram or something because I'll, I I want to share with you, Paul. Just uh, uh, there are stories that are coming out of this that your story is making a difference in people's lives, and so whatever kind of pops up, um, I'll forward it to you because I want you to know, you know, because you're not about yourself, which we just talked about, but you, your story, your journey, how you live your life, your language, everything. Um, is inspiring people and inspires myself and my wife, and we're so grateful for you. Uh, last thing is, uh, what's your favorite book of all time? And if you had to give advice to somebody following in your footsteps, what would it be one piece of advice? Okay, I'm assuming we're not going to do the Bible, correct? Uh, you, I, no, don't do the Bible. Okay, um, and I'm going to do two. I know that's really bad. That's okay. Or, oh, gosh. Three. No, you, East of Eden. I just love East of Eden. Yeah. John Steinbeck. You know? John Steinbeck. Okay. I yeah. just love it. It's a great allegorical story. Uh, two, Ragamuffin Gospel. Yeah. Um, for anybody who strives to be an incredible Christian, it tells you you don't have to crush it every day. You yeah, just wow. just be obedient. I love that's Brennan Manning, yep. Ragamuffin Gospel. And the third one is Million Miles in a Thousand Years by Donald yep. Miller. Yep. Um, because uh, as a married person, uh, any book that you read with your wife is twice as powerful. And it gave yes. us such great wow. common language about the life that we were going to choose to live. And so those three I go back to. I love those books. So specifically, Million Miles in a Thousand Years, uh, Read it with your spouse if you're married. That's your yeah, story. and it's not a marriage book at all. You can no, no, if totally. you're single yeah. or whatever. But it is all about being intentional about the story that you want to write. Yeah. And I think that's a great question for people to ask, especially this time of year. Yeah, uh, one piece of advice: somebody following your footsteps. Um, you can pick any angle. If you couldn't hear that, that's just a deep breath. Wherever you're at, just take a deep breath. That is a picture of oxygen filling your lungs. It it gets rid of the bad air, puts fresh air in. This is a picture of what scripture tells us, that his mercies are new every morning. Wherever you're at, however you're listening or watching or observing, the Holy Spirit wants to remind you that you get to be new. And that newness affords you that the next step that you take is the best step that you can take. So be obedient and um, let tomorrow take care of itself. Um, but today, take a deep breath, know that things are new, surround yourself with people that will remind you that His mercies are new, and um, be on the lookout because your best days are ahead. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, we'd love for you to subscribe to this channel. We've got new episodes releasing every single week. We'd also love to hear your questions or comments. You can uh, comment below. You can also find us on Instagram at Exception Podcast. And I want to give a quick shout out to our producer, Tissel. My name's Kirk Graham, and we'll see you back next week.